Good morning. So today we're going to just dive right in and start with the do now. Um, so the instructions for the do now are to define the underlined word in the following sentence without using a dictionary or Googling it. Send me your answer when you're finished via direct message. Um, the sentence is, he was fascinated by her physiognomy. So you're going to try to define the word physiognomy. Go ahead, just make it your best guess, send them don't think too hard about it. Um, this is not being graded for correctness. It's being considered a participation grade and it also counts as your attendance. So go ahead and submit those guesses. Great, great. So I'm getting some, her study of physics, <laughs> her physical appearance. That one's not far off. All right. All right. So now that you've all sent those in, um, I'm going to let you know that the truth is this sentence does not have enough context uh, for you to make a good assumption of what the word physiognomy means, right? So it doesn't have enough information in the sentence to tell you what physiognomy means. But let's take a look of this sentence, right? So we're going to try that again. We're going, <laughs> we're going to try that again. We're going to go define the underlined word physiognomy without using a dictionary or Googling it. And you're going to send me your new answer. He was fascinated by her physiognomy, mostly her bright green eyes and rounded cheeks. All right. So I'm getting answers like her physical appearance, her looks, the way that she looked, and her face. All right. Yeah. So the actual definition of physiognomy is her face, right? He was fascinated by her face, mostly her bright green eyes and rounded cheeks. But the best part about using context clues is that the definition does not have to be exact. What you're trying to do is take the information around a difficult word like physiognomy and figure out what it means based on what else is in the sentence or in the sentences surrounding, right? And it doesn't have to be perfect. It just has to help you understand what the author is trying to say. So for this class, we're gonna be practicing context clues and we're gonna be going over close reading skills and all of the students will be able to annotate an excerpt and identify keywords and phrases through context clues. All right, so we are going to keep working with the scarlet letter and I'm gonna give you some tools here to help you annotate an excerpt from the scarlet letter. So annotate means to, to take notes on, right? A notation, right? So we're gonna start looking at these five types of context clues first. Uh, the first one is definition. That one is pretty obvious and you've seen it. Um, it's, it's when a word has its meaning explained immediately after it's used. So the example they give is haberdashery, which is a store that sells men's clothing is becoming more common today, right? And, and that one is super obvious. It's when a difficult word has the definition in the sentence right after. Uh, restatement or synonym clues. So we know synonyms mean words that are the same. Uh, so restatement is when there's a difficult word and then the phrase immediately following it is a simpler way to say that word. So the example they give is that Lou was sent to the haberdashery to find a new suit he needed to wear one for his uncle's wedding. So he's sent to the haberdashery. Haberdashery is a place you can be sent to find a new suit. So a haberdashery is a place where you can find a suit, right? The third type is contrast or antonym clues. And the biggest thing about antonym, antonym means opposite, right? Um, the biggest thing about antonym clues is that you're looking for signal words that'll tell you that an antonym is coming. So words like, but, or unlike, and then they give an example, right? So the example they give here is that Lou wanted to go to the haberdashery, but Anne wanted to shop at the boutique. So Anne wanting to shop at the boutique, boutiques are where you buy women's clothing. So it means that Lou wanted to go to the haberdashery, which is presumably a place where you could buy 
men's clothing. At the very least, from this example here, you could find out that haberdashery was a place to shop, right? I don't know if it necessarily gives you enough information to assume that the haberdashery is for men's clothing, but it's the opposite of where Anne wanted to go, which is to the boutique. So the inference or general context clues are one of the most common. It's definitely what you see um, basically in everything. It's very common in the scarlet letter that we're gonna work with next. Um, and basically it means that a word that is not immediately clarified, so something that's not defined or like something that doesn't have a synonym provided, um, has information around it that allows you to infer or imply, right? So infer and imply mean the same thing. Infer to make an inference, implied meaning it's something that you can conclude based on the information that you've been given, right? So you have to look for clues within the sentence before the word is used and after the word is used. Uh, the example they give is the haberdashery was Lou's favorite place. He loved shopping for nice suits. The people who worked there were so kind and helpful, right? So that last sentence is not really useful in this instance, but it's good to look at the sentences surrounding because you don't know when you're gonna find clarification on that word when it comes to general context clues. Um, so the haberdashery was Lou's favorite place. We can assume that the haberdashery is a place because it was Lou's favorite. And if he loves shopping for nice suits is following immediately after, we can assume that the haberdashery was a place to shop for nice suits, right? And then the fifth option on this list is punctuation, right? So punctuation, that has some sort of interrupter in a sentence might be an instance where they're giving you a clue to what the word means that you're trying to figure out. So like punctuation, like dashes, parentheses, quotation marks, uh, putting something in italics, they usually appear as an interruption to the thought of the sentence, right? And it sometimes is a clue that they're going to help you out with a word that came prior. So the examples are Tom's father was a haberdasher or a men's shopkeeper in the story, right? Uh, and and it's, it's a great visual cue, right? Because they're really easy to see and pick up on. And you don't have to like scan sentences and look for general context clues when you're being given punctuation clues, right? So those are five, this PDF will be available on the Google Classroom. Um, those are just five examples of ways that you can look for context clues, but you can also look for how a word is being used in a sentence. And you can look for how the sentence would read without the word and figure out what kind of word would fit in that place. And I'll elaborate on that a little bit. Um, we're gonna look at an annotation model together um, so we're going to go ahead and practice on this together. And then after that, I'm going to break you into small groups, into breakout rooms, and you're going to go ahead and annotate an excerpt that I will send you with your groups and with your partners, right? Um, so I'm going to read the excerpt out loud. Uh, excerpt one from chapter two, The Marketplace. Uh, the grass plot before the jail in Prison Lane on a certain summer morning, not less than two centuries ago, was occupied by a pretty large number of the inhabitants of Boston, all with their eyes intently fastened on the iron clamped oaken door. Amongst any other population or at a later period in the history of New England, the grim rigidity that petrified the bearded physiognomies of these good people would have augured some awful business in hand. It could have betokened nothing short of the anticipated execution of some noted culprit on whom the sentence of a legal tribunal had but confirmed the verdict of public sentiment. But in that early severity of the Puritan character, an inference of this kind could not so indubitably be drawn. It might be that a sluggish bond servant or an undutiful child whom his parents had given over to the civil authority was to be corrected at the whipping post. All right, so that's, that's dense. Uh, we're gonna just take a look at the words that have been highlighted, right? Um, so let's start with intently, right? Can anyone tell me what word intently sounds like? Uh, yeah, it's very good. Intention, right? So what does intention mean? It's like, it's what you mean to do, right? It's your, your purpose. 
Um, so I went ahead and underlined fastened because I thought that was a decent context clue to understand what it meant for someone's eyes to be intently fastened on the iron clamp door. Um, so if we're gonna say intently comes from intention, then we're gonna say that in this case, it means their eyes were fastened with purpose and they were paying attention. All right, so let's take a look at physiognomies. <laughs> all right, so I know we define this in the do now and you all know that physiognomy means faces, but let's take a look at what surrounding the word physiognomy could mean or it could indicate that physiognomy means face, right? So this section of the sentence reads, the grim rigidity that petrified the bearded physiognomies of these good people. So I underlined the word bearded because it's describing the word that we're trying to understand, right? So you always wanna look, if there's something you can't understand entirely, you wanna to try to look and see what's describing it, what is acting on that word. Um, so to say bearded, what else could be bearded but somebody's face, right? It's like, this. these are the Puritans. It's not like they're out there with their bearded dragons. You know, a bearded face could be petrified and grim and rigid, meaning their faces are serious, right? So we're gonna say face, right? Because we know that one, but we found that out by looking in this instance, you could find that out by all of the descriptions that are being put onto the face, especially bearded, right? <clears throat> and oh, and while you're going through, so the easy way to add these comments, to add these annotations in Google Drive is to simply highlight the word. Oh, come on. I say simply as I, okay. So you highlight the word and then you look for either this little bubble that has the plus, or if it doesn't appear on the side, you can also click up here where it says add comment, or you can use the shortcut control alt M uh, which the, I don't, <laughs> but anyway, so we're going to add comment to try to understand the word betokened. Okay. So betokened, it could have had, but it could have betokened nothing short of the anticipated execution of some noted culprit. Okay. So they're saying that their grim faces could have blanked, right? We know betokened is a verb in this instance. Let's take a look at how it's being used. It could have betokened nothing short of the anticipated execution of some noted culprit. So anticipated is describing the execution, right? So they're all gathering, anticipating an execution, right? Their faces are grim and they're looking at this door and something bad is coming, some awful business is in hand. It could have betokened nothing short of the anticipated. So it could have, what other word could, could go there that wouldn't change this sentence, right? It could have predicted the anticipated execution, right? Their faces could have been a sign of this execution. Um, I've relied heavily on the word anticipated, um, and I read betokened as foreshadowed or as um, to predict. So we're going to say and that's the beauty of context clues, right, is that they don't have to be perfect. It doesn't have to be an exact definition, right? Um, especially if it's just to understand what the author's trying to say while you're reading it, right? Um, nothing short of the anticipated execution of some noted culprit on whom the sentence of a legal tribunal had but confirmed the verdict of public sentiment, right? So I didn't know what a legal tribunal was, but I know if it has legal in it, then it has something to do with the law, right? And I underlined the previous part, the sentence of a legal tribunal and the verdict of public opinion, right? So where do we find sentencing and verdicts that usually has to do with a courtroom? right? Or has to do with some sort of legal proceedings or a case. Um, so I put a courtroom trial, right? So let's take a second and pause and see 
what kind of meaning we can derive from the full passage now that we've added some notes on what these confusing words might mean, right? So you've got all these people from Boston standing on the lawn, on the grass plot, right? Um, they're staring at this door, this wooden door. Uh, and in any other population after this period in New England, their faces being so petrified and rigid would have meant that they were anticipating an execution or something really horrible, right? Something that was like a public hanging that was decided in court and confirmed the verdict of public sentiment, right? Meaning like the court had decided that someone was a criminal and should be hanged and the public sentiment part of it means like everybody believed that, right? Um, which is really important to consider when talking about a book about the witch trials, right? Um, public sentiment had so much to do with how these these women and, and men were criminalized and executed uh, unfairly. Um, but, right, so the next sentence, so we've got some meaning from here, but in that early severity of the Puritan character, an inference of this kind should not, could not so indubitably be drawn, right? So they're saying like all of these people standing on the lawn in any other time, right? Amongst any other population or later period in history, all of these people looking so serious, waiting for this like trial execution, like it would have meant that they were being punished for something severe that deserved execution. But in the early severity of the Puritan character, meaning the early severity of Puritan people and their mindsets, an inference, inference meaning an assumption, right? A logical assumption of this kind could not so indubitably be drawn. Indubitably is another confusing word, um, but I'm gonna tell you right now it's certainly, right? Could not indubitably be drawn. It might be that a sluggish bond servant or an undutiful child whom his parents had given over to the civil authority was to be corrected at the whipping post. So the reason this part is highlighted in blue is because this sentence is key to the understanding of this passage, right? So they're saying in any other time, all these people looking so serious on this lawn would have meant someone was getting executed. But what they're all here to see is potentially a sluggish bond servant. So like a, a, a slow servant or an undutiful child, a child who does not behave, who his parents had given over to the civil authority. So the parents turned over their child who is not behaving to be corrected at the whipping post. So this is a community of people who if their servants are too slow or their children are too rowdy and don't behave, they'll turn them over to the authorities and they'll be whipped in the town square and everybody will show up to watch, right? So that's what this is trying to say is like, it's describing the severity of this community and the Puritan character, right? It's describing severe punishment in a harsh society. So you're gonna go ahead and break off into your, into your breakout groups. If no one has any questions, great. Okay, so you're gonna go ahead and break off into your breakout groups. You're gonna get a similar passage and you're gonna go ahead and work with your partners to annotate it and make sure that you highlight at least one line like this one in a different color to highlight an important part of the text that helps you generate understanding, right? That helps you know what the author is trying to say. All right.